or it was when I lived there. Tiny town outside of Spokane, Washington, in between Spokane and Coeur d'Alene on the freeway. Yay! Um, Crickets. Went to, <laughs> uh, went to Whitworth uh, University, uh, Presbyterian School up in Spokane. I uh, have a bachelor's degree in philosophy. Met my wife working at Camp Luther Haven up in Coeur d'Alene. Yay. Um, I've got four kids, uh, ranging in age from this weekend, nine. Yes. Uh, to 18 <laughs> months. Um, so um, that's, that's full and busy. Um, I went to Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, did a four-year uh, MDiv residential program. Uh, so they dumped in all the book learning into me um, as much as they could. Um, I s majored in um, ethics all the way through. <laughs> so uh, if you're getting a different kind of a flavor off of me, then, then that's, that's why it was, that's you know, systematic theology and ethics and moral theology, all of those mm -hmm. things, uh, as much as I could, uh, and tried not to translate, because I'm terrible at it. So, um, now I'm here. We're back. Awesome. We're back. We're back live. So, we only have about 30 minutes left, but it's a shame, because there's a lot of stuff trickling in. Um, just shameless plug. We got to launch that podcast because there's a lot of questions that we're going to try and get to still, and yeah. we still want to get to. But all right, so let's just stick right along. This will be directed to you. We just had it come in on our on our video. So the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the Bible and the Quran. Are they referencing the same Trinity? No. I'll just be next question. Really, <laughs> uh, you know, this is kind of bridges between last last month and this month. Uh, the urge is to say we all worship the same God. I will be clear there is only one God. He is triune. That's not the God that the Quran paints. Even if it were, and even if we were going to have a Unitarian view of God, that would be there's only one God, the Trinity is out, all this stuff. Jesus is just a prophet and the Holy Spirit is this peaceful, easy feeling. Even if we were going to go that way, the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament is fundamentally different and makes different demands on us than the God of the Quran. Okay. So leaving aside all the other things I could say disparaging um, the, the Quran, which are legion, but I won't get into, um, the, the, just the flat answer is no. Um, and I wish, it were the, I wish there, there was harmony there, but there really isn't. It's a completely different religion. The only thing that I would add to that is that the Quran was written after. And so, 600 years after. Yep. And so if it is referencing the Holy Spirit, it's doing it by reference. It's not doing it accurately. Right. So, so it's not referencing the Holy Spirit. Not accurately. I haven't read the Quran. It's on my to-do list. All right. We're going to go back to one of our farm <laughs> questions. Person. Then we'll get to um, checkered shirt, we'll call him. Uh, <laughs> can the, this will be for you, Josh. Can the Holy Spirit be taken from you? No. I mean, what, how, do you, how do you want to deal with that? Um, I'm just going to short answer it and say no. Can you do things that grieve the Holy Spirit? Can you do things that... Drive them off? Yeah, sort of. yeah, I mean, again, we get into the question of election, reprobation, all of this yeah. stuff, and trying to, not, trying to not go there and use those super big terms. I would just say the answer is no. And, and in any sort of practical way... The answer is no. Now, maybe on a theological way, when we get to God and we ask a question about the cans and knots and can he make a rock that he can't move and, and that sort of thing, maybe he'll give us some mind-blowing answer. But practically speaking, no. Uh, I, I, would, I would say no. It's, it's the fear. It's David's fear in Psalm 51. Yeah. Take Remove not spirit. your Holy Spirit mm -hmm. from me. So the only one who's going to be able to take the Holy Spirit from you is God. You can't be overpossessed. You can't have a demon rip him out of you. The whole right. nine yards. With that said, um, why would God ever do that? Right. He's, I, he called you to him in the first day. And, yeah. and um, you know, uh, I will be a little more on the you can drive him away in turning off your own spiritual sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, just saying, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm, I'm out. Um, that's on your side. Um, but it's the fear. And and actually, from Scripture, you get the other way, right? God being gracious, God giving the Holy Spirit, God saying, 
uh, I'll just pick Jonah, right? I'm going to roast you guys. I'm going to just blow you out of the water. And then at the end of the book, to the Ninevites, he says, no. And, and I'm going to change my mind from the human perspective and just full out change my mind and say, this is not what I'm going to do. And instead you get grace. Yep. And since God works that way, God will, if he's going to change his mind, it'll always be for, toward grace. It's always more Holy Spirit. Here, have some more. You can't right. possibly like, mess up with more. Can you grieve the Holy Spirit? Can, can, you, can, you, can you shut yourself off to the Holy Spirit? It's sort of like every day. Kind of, you know, I mean, play Luke Skywalker and the newest Star Wars. Anyway, uh, can, 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 you, can you do that? Can you have an action that has a negative, if you will, emotional effect on the Holy Spirit? Uh, yes. But can you make the Holy Spirit do something? Yeah. No. You don't have the power. It's the other way. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, and, he, he and, and, and so on a practical level for your everyday living as, as a Christian, no. Like, yeah, no. you know, maybe, like I said, there's a deep theological thing we don't understand, but on a practical level, the little ants that we are, you know, don't even worry about it. Nope. Yeah, I mean, I agree with those things. <laughs> um, yeah, the Holy Spirit. The only thing that I would add to that, I think, is that the likelihood... Um, yeah, because God gives his Holy Spirit. We, when we receive Christ and we receive the Holy Spirit, we are transformed in our nature and we begin a, you know, a real process of becoming more and more who we're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, we're sealed by the Spirit. I think, I think that the far more likely um, understanding of when you perceive that to be happening is that that person, for whatever reason, never genuinely accepted God on God's terms, you know, that they were putting on some sort of a... If you had a, to choose between the two, that would facade. be the most likely. Yeah, if I had to choose between God pulling his Holy Spirit back from someone and them just appearing oh. to us like we had the Holy Spirit, and but us being wrong, then that's what I would, I would think. You know, when you get into the, whatever, some of the writings of the, like, church fathers and stuff, they distinguish between the... The church, the invisible church, the church that, um, the church meanings, all the members of the church, but the invisible church of God who all of those people, you know, in outside of time and space um, came to him or whatever. And then the visible church, which is just the people that, as far as we can tell, are part of God's people. They're alive now. You know? Yeah, they're, they're alive now. And we can't always be right about who we think is in God's invisible church. Do have a live question? All right, so this will go to Colin first. Let's go ahead. Um, the part that the Holy Spirit, the, where are you going? The, <laughs> um, the part that the Holy Spirit takes in that, um, I would say, is a, a full part. Like, in terms of speaking in tongues, um, I think all a person really has to do is be, be willing to be the vessel of that, of that gift. God has chosen a person at a specific time to speak in a language that they don't know. Um, in Scripture, obviously, we see that at Pentecost when you have all these Jews from all over the Roman Empire that speak all sorts of different languages coming into one spot, and the apostles are given the gift of tongues in order to communicate with all of them the gospel at a particular place in time that just blows the church up, you know, just crazy exponential growth. And um, that was 100% the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, what was the other part of that question? It's just, what part does the Holy Spirit have yeah. in speaking in tongues? I don't think there was another part. I feel like there's I hear another part. Well, <laughs> so I guess, too, it's always pragmatic in, in the Lutheran view. Why is, why is the Holy Spirit doing this? Because he wants the gospel to get out. Yep. And because it's handy. It's super handy. It's not how we do things today generally because the church is established. And, and like for me, there was no gift of the you know, tongues when I learned Greek and Hebrew. It was just 
brute force memorization and, and academic abuse, right? I mean, that's how le- <laughs> seminary is, right? Just learn it. Um, and so we can do that, right? And when we send missionaries, when my church sends missionaries to, let's say, Uganda, right? We don't even teach them the language. We teach them how to learn another language so that they come alongside somebody and they're teaching you the language. You form this friendship. You get to tell them about Jesus. It's really super stressful. Imagine being a brand new pastor, missionary, and not knowing the language. I love it. It's horrible. Absolutely horrible, but amazing in terms of what it does and accomplishes. So we choose to do that differently now. Um, I think each of the charismatic, ostentatious <laughs> gifts, shall we say, right, that, that we really kind of want to talk about, uh, usually it's pragmatic. There's a good reason in a time and a place, and I'll say some of them really specifically, historically seem to pop up at certain times. Mm-hmm. And some of them are really mundane. Um, so I will be there as a pastor in a, ho- in a hospital room praying with somebody, praying for healing, direct healing. And it's happened, right? Not me. Holy Spirit does it. Not often, but when it does, this is just amazing. Because God wanted to do that right then for whatever his purpose was. That sort of thing happens way more frequently and we just kind of leave it, right? As opposed to um, the gift of legitimate prophecy, right? Um, Foretelling. At, or, mm-hmm. And that one with prophecy, it actually comes up more with forthtelling. Mm-hmm. Forthtelling prophecy is telling the truth about a situation. Almost, if you read the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, most of it is not foretelling. Most of it is forthtelling. Shape up, guys. <laughs> Bad stuff is coming. There's a little foretelling in there. But a mm-hmm. lot of it is just shape up. Knock it off. If you read the book of the 12, right? Um, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Almost all of that is foretelling. Shape up. There's a prophetic gift. Um, so the Holy Spirit takes a role and just says, are you on? Do you want to go? Because if you want to go, I mean, we're, we're ready. Let's do this thing. Yeah. Right? Are you receptive? And so there's the business with grieving the Holy Spirit and saying, nope, not it. Don't do that if you can help it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, he'll, he'll find another person. Don't worry. With, with that said, there is a, there's always that pragmatic question. And so as a Lutheran, um, with tongues specifically, I always ask that pragmatic question. One I say, is it scriptural? Is there an interpreter? If there's not an interpreter, be quiet and sit down or I'll remove you. Because that's what Paul tells me to do. Which is the part of 1 Corinthians that people forget to read when they right. read the other parts. And then why is God doing this? And so if somebody stands up, and I have a gentleman who's fluent in French, if he stands up and starts speaking in French, then you know, I'll say, this is wonderful, but you've got to tell me what you just said. Why'd you do that? Oh, there's this Francophone African guy in the back, and he didn't understand what was going on in service. Okay, well, that's, that's awesome. Um, that's different, though. That fundamentally different than uh, what's called glossolalia. That's the technical term for speaking in heavenly tongues during a worship service. Lutherans don't do that, by the way, and we're very skeptical of it on two fronts. One, again, where's the interpreter? Two, uh, and this is a psychological pastoral concern, what's going to happen next time that this thing happens and you don't get that charismatic gift? What's going to happen to your faith? Hmm. And we're so worried that you'll say, well, this is just crazy and God's not dependable because last time I went to the holiness revival, whatever, uh, Skaterama, then I got the slain in the spirit and spoke in tongues and fell over dancing. And then the second time I went, nothing. Right. And from a pastoral standpoint, I want to say, no, God is alive. God is good. You had that experience. Treasure that. That's awesome. I'm not going to do anything with that. But get back in. Read his word. Pray. Do what he tells you to do. Not with an eye toward having another one of those experiences, but with an eye toward being a Christian, doing what he wants you to do, and, and living. So... Yeah, and, and, and I would say that if you had an experience where you spoke in tongues and that experience caused you to then question your faith later, I would ask the question if that experience was from the Holy Spirit to begin with, personally. Right. And I, I haven't seen really anywhere in the scripture where I didn't feel that somebody was eisegeting it or isolating the passage and making it what they want to. I haven't seen anywhere in Scripture where there is that, what do you call it? Gossalalia. You, you have to speak in tongues to even say it. Um, <laughs> but, Thanks, yeah, I, I haven't seen anywhere in Scripture where that's, where that's honestly justified. And I think 
in Scripture, what we have, and we would agree with our Lutheran brothers here, um, is we have speaking in tongues that takes place for a purpose, which is the spreading of the gospel, the edification of the body, glorifying Christ. And when a person does not speak in tongues in a way that shows the image of God, then that is not from God. And Paul goes so far as to say that if a person who does not believe walks into your congregation and sees all these people speaking in tongues, they're going to think that you're crazy. So how can, if, if, if a spirit is moving, again, I would go back to the question of what spirit is it when that is happening? Because I, I don't see any justification for that. It, to me, in those circumstances, it is a person, it is a spirit that is bringing attention to itself or to the gift or to the person who, who it was given to. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and yeah, but do, do I believe that speaking in tongues occurred and, and has a place? Sure, it has to meet these qualifications or it's not from God. That's how, I, that's how I would say. Do we know in Scripture whether all these instances of speaking in tongues are legitimate languages of man or are some of them? They're always um, legitimate languages. The, so the Scripture about um, speaking in tongues, and Paul, pulls on, Paul goes on to say, you know, I speak, I speak in, in tongues more than anybody. More than anybody. Like Paul says, yeah, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm better than all of you if we're going to be on bragging on these terms. I can speak in we, tongues more so, than anybody. So but, you know... If, if you're going to do it, like, and you don't have an interpreter, then go relate to God on that level in your closet. Right. Right? Right. Is that... What could he possibly mean by that? Yeah, well, I mean, is that... I'm just... I've never pictured this before, but is, is this, um, like, somebody is, is from France... And they can they can genuinely pray to God better in their own language, but they shouldn't do that in amongst other people or something like that. Oh, and to go, or is that some sort of, you know, heavenly language that they're talking about? No, you know, because I, you know, German Lutheran, so I run into German speaking people all the time. And when I was in on my internship in Michigan, the entire congr- like the entire place was full of German speakers. And so I would go and I'd say, "Do you want to say the Lord's Prayer or the Apostles' Creed or whatever?" you know, in German and say yes. And I actually had it in the back of my little book for when I was, you know, taking communion to these people and, and doing this stuff. And so if it's a recognizable human language and they're not bothering anybody um, in service, um, yeah, the, the big issue is that you have a multi-ethnic church that's just exploding and how do you handle other tongues in church? And the church pretty quickly historically just decides that it's going to be um, Greek. Because that's what everybody speaks. Mm-hmm. And we'll, we'll just kind of leave that there. Um, Paul speaks in lots of tongues because he goes all over all the place. All over the place. And not everybody speaks Greek. Greek is a hard language to learn how to speak. It's a really difficult language to learn. Um, it, it's harder than English. Uh, and that's saying something. Um, and so I think there's a part where Paul wants to say, look, if you interact with God and experience God and you want to have a relationship with God and that's ecstatic. It's full of speaking in tongues, it's full of weeping, being slain in the spirit, all these things. I'm not going to say no, but I am going to say Sunday morning in church around everybody else is not the time or place for that because we need to establish some good order. And what you see is groups of people who do value this starting to kind of pop up and it becomes a monastic experience. Um, And so... Uh, while I would like everybody to be, okay, I'd really like everybody to be Lutheran, right? But I actually see value in denominations. Because hmm. we, this, the, the, you know, the, the tongues thing is one thing um, that we all kind of need to hold the line on. Mm-hmm. Good job, Josh and Colin on that. But We try. Uh, <laughs> we're just Baptists. But. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, like, yeah, this is, this is something where, look, Lutherans look at theology, look at the world way different. And there's they're just a group of people. And if we take out Lutheranism or Baptist or Pentecostal or whatever, then we're saying this group of people doesn't get to go to heaven, doesn't hmm. get to go to Jesus, doesn't get to get ministered to by a man of God. And <laughs> what? No. So um, I, that's not my pitch for denominations, but I can kind of see how it, it's going. And it, it's kind of a, one of those things that just kind of naturally, I think, follows from this, this go to your closet, have this experience alone, or if there's two or three of you. 
Yeah, I, it's it's the same thing as you know Jesus talking about <laughs> cutting off your hand. You know, like <clears throat> that's not what he was saying. I mean, it's what he said, but he was he's using language to show the extreme of something, and you know, like origin took it to to a, a whole new level but um anyway yeah that's not i i don't i don't same thing with like praying in the closet or whatever it's like that's not the point the point is don't cause a disorder that's that's the point cool uh we got about eight minutes left so uh here's so a question we, so rapid fire lightning round yeah here's a question um someone might have been able to piece an answer or a version of an answer to this question based on previous you know points throughout this last this last um, hour and a half, but uh, I don't know where we're at. You? Maybe. Can you receive the Holy Spirit if you haven't been baptized? <laughs> yes? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Lightning round. Yes. Yes. He comes as he pleases. Yes. It irritates the theologians, but it, it excites the pastors. Yes. We love seeing it. Lightning round. Should we pray or worship the Holy Spirit? Pray to. Pray to or worship the Holy Spirit. Not separately from God and not, not lifting him up higher than the Father or the Son. Right. Maybe you can pray to God through the Holy Spirit, giving credit to you know, God's character and how he presents himself. We pray as Lutherans to the Holy Spirit on occasions where we know something the Holy Spirit is involved in is about to happen. Sure. So these, okay these are that. very, very mm. specific times. On Pentecost, we pray a prayer of thanksgiving to the Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming, enlivening our hearts with your gifts. You're taking God where he presented himself right. in that particular right. moment. Um, but to isolate the Holy Spirit and then... You, well, this is back to, out to of the, the thing from Sinead O'Connor, right, from last, last month, where she's talking about how uh, she's a really bad relationship with men right, right, right. Oh, yeah, so, okay, okay, you know, yeah, yeah. she says I only pray to the Holy Spirit I only act with, interact with God the Holy Spirit right. because the Father and the Son are men and they're all the devil um, and <laughs> I'm going to say you know this is really messed up again I'm glad that you're still in communication with God um, this is a mark of human sin and human failure on a multitude of levels is it theologically right? no um, is it going to get you by? Um, I'm praying it does I want to see some reconciliation to get in there and work on that, right? There needs to be maturity there. But oh, whatever her, her backlog thing is. So, you know, um, I'm just thinking we have a hymn in the hymnal. It's over there. Um, or you can look it up in your pews, right? It says, to God the Holy Spirit we pray, mm. right? And it's one of those like ordination, installation, church life yeah. sort of things. But yeah, normally no. I don't. Th- I don't pray think the, through the Holy Spirit. I don't think the Holy Spirit would appreciate that. I think the Holy Spirit would be like, "Nah, you should." Anyway, go, go on. Uh, well, speaking of him, uh, other him, you guys keep referring to the Holy Spirit as He and Him. Um, are we? Why? Is See, the Holy Spirit male, female? No such thing. It's the Holy Spirit is neuter. <laughs> But in the original language, the original language, I believe, was, is it Ruach? Ruach. I don't know how to present it. Male pronoun. Which is a female pronoun. Mm. Um, But basically the church fathers, the church fathers for the most part had a consensus of male. That's... So linguistically between pneumatos, which is the Greek, or pneuma, pneuma, which is the Greek, and I think that is a female noun, ruach, which is another female noun. Um, Usually those are just the, um, and I can hear professors screaming at me, but usually those are just quirks of the language, right? The words happen to be feminine, that that follows a certain conjugation pattern. That's not to say that we think of it like this. The real reason I keep saying he with the Holy Spirit is to press in. He has an identity. He is a person of the Trinity. The Trinity is unity, and so instead of referring to the Holy Spirit as it, which is really impersonal and technically right via the neuter thing, but it would also be right then to call the Father it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, again, God the Father does not have a body. There is no divine gender or... uh, No, sorry, there's no divine biological sex. Right. I'm getting all of my words confused. This is what culture's done to me. I'm sorry. God the Father presents himself as male. He presents himself as male. The Holy Spirit um, doesn't really bother presenting himself in a gender. 
He just goes about and does business. The only reason I've been using gendered language is because uh, I want to make sure that we don't have this impersonality with the Holy Spirit. And I think you run the risk. I think you run the risk when you present the... So let's say that you just want to lean on the other side. We lean toward this side. And you want to lean on the other side and say, ah, well, you could because, you know, the original language and, you know, right. whatever. So let's say you did that. Well, then you've got God the Father, and then you've got God the female, and then you've got God the Son. So when you've got God the Father and God the female <laughs> and God natural. the Son, there's a natural idea that God, the, that God the female and God the Father were what created God the Son. That gets really complicated because it's just not true. And it goes against Trinitarian doctrine. So I think it's, it's a much easier uh, way of explaining it to keep it him. Because as we talked about last, last time, um, the, the, the Son, the, the Holy Spirit uh, basically generates... From the, the the relationship of the father and the son, not the other way around. The son doesn't come out of the relationship between the father and the Holy Spirit. Right. There's a bunch of early church heresies and craziness. Right. The Holy um, Spirit is not the divine feminine. The Holy Spirit is the one that proceeds from. No. And if you're looking for that language, there's two times in the Old Testament where God the Father refers to Himself as a in a feminine role, and it's always in a mothering role, taking care of us little right. kind so the, of... The hen... Yeah, as a mother yeah. hen gathers her... And notice it's even metaphorical, right? Just like a mother hen, right? Right. And there's a, kind of the same language. It's in Isaiah and Jeremiah, same image kind of idea. Um, and so I, it, I'm really kind of left with just a... I really don't want to call the Holy Spirit it because it impersonalizes the Holy Spirit... What else you got? Trans. Don't even go there. <laughs> like, so, like, I'm just like, oh. <laughs> so the, yeah. So, so it's easier. It's easier to call it him because it makes it a much clearer picture of his function rather than the other thing, which you know makes it harder. Cool. There's two minutes left, but uh, oh, here's one. Uh, well, you just answered it. Is the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? You said. Yes, you referred to it. Absolutely. Um, Done. As a matter of fact, in verse 2 of Genesis, <laughs> yeah, hovering over the, the waters. The Spirit of God hovers over the waters before earth was given real form. Okay, next. I mean, every other question we have on our preform questions is a different version of something you've already said. Oh, okay. So I think we'll just wrap it up with that. So thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'd like to invite everyone um, here and tuning in to come to next month's show on the date of what's the date? <laughs> last Sunday in March. Is it just the last, the Sunday, last of, Sunday in March? Last Sunday of March, 25th? so whatever that might be. Is that right? March 25th, I think? Yes, yes March 25th, 7 p.m. That is at Zion Lutheran, which is in downtown Portland. So come, come to that and be looking forward to that. The topic is the dual nature of Christ, so that should be a Great one, a very yeah, interesting does, one. Just for, what does dual nature of Christ mean so that the audience understands what we're talking about? Oh, you want to? Uh, uh, so we're talking about Christ as fully God and Christ as fully man. There you go. So if you ever wondered how he can be God and man, that's the one to come to. So yeah, again, that's at Zion Lutheran in downtown Portland. On the panel is Daniel, who's the pastor of that particular church. It will be Pastor James Pierzina of Lathia Bible Fellowship and maybe David. Are you down for that? You don't know? We'll yeah, get back to you. Might be, pending. I got a pending. I got a, you know, pending check schedule. Check TBA. Button. Pending. So look forward to that. It should be a really good discussion. Um, there's different ways you can participate. Again, uh, if you have questions, you can get on the Facebook and Twitter and ask those questions using the hashtag cross X, letter X, or um, from the survey link on the Crass Examination um, Facebook page. Um, invite people, tell people about what we're doing, and um, share this video or these videos, I guess, that they are now um, on your Facebook pages. Um, so yeah, rewatch, share, share those videos, share the event page on Facebook. You can check out vigilance.blog and look forward to a, a future podcast where these guys will tackle like lingering questions that maybe we can have time to get to or whatever it may be. So yeah, lots on the horizon with cross-examination for everyone to look forward to. Um, lastly, if you are without a church home and need a good starting point for getting back into your faith, 
Uh, we have a service that can help you with that. So find a person wearing one of these white name badges here, and they will help you with that. There's a survey you can fill out. You can seek out Jasmine Pierzina of Aletheia Bible Fellowship, and she will help you with that. Um, or you can just talk to any one of these guys that you see, because this is their job. Their job is to help you um, in your relationship with God and developing your faith and talking to you about these things that we're talking about. So um, don't, don't not seek them out. Seek them out. Um, so, yeah, with that said, thank you. Thank you, David, for opening up your doors. Thank you to Emmanuel Lutheran. Thank you to these other two guys, Josh and Colin, for being here, and we look forward to the next show. So have a good night, everyone. Thanks.